Hello, everybody. Welcome back, and welcome to another training session with the Google News Initiative. I'm John. I'm the Walkley Foundation's Project Manager for the GNI Training Network in our part of the world here in Australia. And once again, we're joined by Miguel de Zosa. He's the Google News Lab Teaching Fellow for Australia and New Zealand. And today, he'll be guiding us through a set of time-saving methods to help verify the authenticity and accuracy of images, videos, and reports that you find in social media and elsewhere online. Now, before we begin, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered today. And for me, that's the Gadigal and uh, Wongal people of the Eora Nation. So I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, as I mentioned, mentioned, we're going to be talking about verification and journalism is often described as a discipline of verification. You'll often hear editors, and reporters describe the essence of their work as finding the facts, presenting the facts, and also unearthing the truth about the facts. And much of our lives these days are led online, and so too are these facts found and tested and corroborated online. And in a world where the average person can create and share content with ease, with more than four and a half billion active internet users, a staggering amount, and billions upon billions of websites, web pages, and social media posts, the work of the journalist has never been so vital, and it's never been so difficult. And it's clear that we need good information now more than ever. And it's never been more important to pause and consider what we see online, whether it's a funny meme, or an out-and-out out conspiracy. And that's why the Walkley Foundation and the Google News Initiative are offering these kinds of free workshops to give you the skills to evaluate the online sources and separate fact from fiction. So if you have a question about anything covered in this workshop, just type it into the chat box and we'll do our best to provide an answer. Now, you can also contact us and that is the email address is newslabsupport at google.com. I'll pop that up on the screen. And you can access step-by-step -step tutorials at any time and at no cost just by going to g.co forward slash news training. Last but not least, as I often mention during these verification workshops, um, the rolled gold standard is First Draft News. They are a fantastic resource. They have spent years empowering people around the world with the, the knowledge and the tools um, to build resilience against harmful, false, and misleading information. So please check them out. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to welcome Miguel. Let me just unmute that. Let me start that all over again. Thank you very much, John. Uh, and it's really great to be here. Um, Welcome to today's Google News Initiative training with thanks to Google News Initiative and the Walkleys for hosting this live webinar. Um, before we begin, I too would also like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of uh, these lands on which we meet and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Uh, I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Now, a little bit about me. Uh, I am, um, I've been working online as a journalist since the mid nineties, most of it uh, on the internet. Uh, and the, um, uh, I've worked on putting out news for uh, sites like um, SBS, uh, news.com.au, Seven News and uh, AAP. Now, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as John said, feel free to ask questions during the live broadcast. Uh, by typing them into the chat box, and one of us will try and get back to you. Now, today, we're going to look take an introductory look at verification of images, video, and people online. Now, digital verification is an important new skill for all of us. It can be time-consuming and complicated, but with a few tools uh, and a little bit of understanding about how those tools work, you can cut yourself a lot of time in research, but also it can be a hell of a lot of fun. You'll see what I mean. Um, over this next little while, we're gonna look at a really useful tool, which is Google's Fact Check Explorer. That's where we're gonna start. We'll then look at a range of tools to help you match images using search engines that we've looked at in our search sessions. 
I'll also show you how to use tools like RevEye, um, keyframe analysis tools, and a very clever Amnesty International collaboration with YouTube, as well as a tool to calculate the sun's, where the sun's shadows fall. It's all very useful for debunking false or fake videos or images. And we'll also take tools, uh, well, sorry, we'll also take a look at tools which you can use to help you find out about social media accounts uh, and test your suspicions about them. I'm sure that when we're done, you'll be able to do a basic image and social verification. So let's get started. Uh, first up, first up, I'd encourage you to check out Google's Fact Check Explorer. Let me just pop that URL on the screen for you. Now, with Fact Check Explorer, um, you're able to browse a whole series of um, fact checks by reputable agencies and outlets around the world, including uh, AFP and AAP in New Zealand and in Australia. For instance, you can search for a politician's statement on a topic. Uh, you can also look for uh, identities or people who've been the subject of, of um, fraudulent claims. Or if you are uh, in, in currently, obviously, you can read, for instance, dozens of well-researched articles debunking the usefulness of hydroxychloroquine as a COVID medication. Um, the tool is all based on the fact check markup tool, and uh, you can read more about it over here. And I'll just pop that URL up for you so you can have a look at that. So, initially, though, in the first instance, when it comes to image verification, a very useful tool is what's known as an EXIF data viewer. Now, EXIF stands for Exchangeable Image File Format, officially EXIF, um, according to uh, image standards. Now, it's a standard that specifies the formats for images, sound, and other ancillary tags. In other words, metadata, which is used by digital cameras, including smartphones, uh, and scanners, and other systems uh, uh, that, uh, that handle image and sound files recorded by digital cameras. Let me just uh, pop up a little help for you on screen so that you know uh, what to search for if you want to read up a little bit more about it. So what you're looking at on screen, though, is a little tool called Jeffrey's Exif View. It's not terribly attractive, but what it does is very effective. Um, I'm just putting the URL up there on screen for you. But um, Jeffrey's Exif Viewer will take any photo from a digital camera or even your iPhone uh, and if you're interested, by the way, in playing along, I suggest you uh, grab a photo that might be on your computer off your iPhone or something like that um, and pop it through there. And what you can see there is, is Jeffrey Dex, if you will, will return you results for all sorts of useful metadata, um, including location codes, the type of camera that was used, uh, whether a flash was fired, uh, what time of day it was shot, usually in UTC time, uh, what device was used, and so on and so forth. Um, really, really useful tool and, and possibly a first resort for any journalists who, uh, for instance, have had uh, somebody send them a photo that they say is uh, uh, an original that they shot on the scene. The other way you should use it is if you're ever verifying any social media content, it's worth asking the person who shot a photo, who claims they shot a photo anyway, to send you the original from their telephone or the camera. That way you can run that through something like this uh, and at least determine some important data that could tell you whether this photo is real or not or where it's from, uh, where it's said to be from or not. Now, uh, I mentioned a little something about social media. Social media platforms like Facebook, uh, Twitter and Instagram all scramble the metadata on all photos that are uploaded to them. It's kind of disappointing for us, but it's a fact of life and a fact of how they manage their massive databases. Now, another uh, aspect to this is, is that uh, EXIF data can be scrubbed. Uh, this is actually a pretty interesting little tool. I'll, I'll make sure I flash this up on the screen, uh, the URL for it. Um, this was actually uh, a tool that was developed during the recent Black Lives Matter protests. 
which allows the user to scrub any metadata and also blur the faces of people in photos. Um, this was developed by uh, some Black Lives Matter protesters who were obviously very handy with the code. And it's a kind of a cool idea, really. Um, it, it, I, I understand it obviously uh, undermines a little bit of what we're trying to do, but it's always worth being aware of the fact that every time a tool is developed that extracts data or, or perhaps reveals a little bit more about the web, there's probably somebody on the other side of that equation doing their best to try and undermine it. And that's why it's really important to, I guess, get something really uh, key in your head now about verification. And that is, is that um, it's always worth keeping up to date with this area. More on that later and how you can do that. So anyway, let's have an understanding about how image searching work, works. Now we all know about Google images, but what about some of the others? Now these search engines, uh, allow actually complement or sometimes better what Google does. And I'll make sure I share all of their URLs with you. Now this is Bing. What you're looking at here is um, uh, a, a result for an image that was put, that was uh, shared on Bing. It's of, actually of Lake, uh, one of the three lakes in Kalamutu and Flores. But what you're looking at here is, is that Bing uh, can actually recognize that image and return similar results. As we've seen when we've covered search before, Bing works in a very similar way to uh, how Google uh, does when it comes to indexing images. However, there is that human component, so you will get some difference. The other thing with Bing that's a very handy little uh, aspect is that it does allow you to read uh, the text contents inside an image. More on that later. So next up, we have Yandex. Now, Yandex, is uh, developed by a uh, Russian company called Yandex, which essentially works in the machine learning area. Now, the thing with Yandex is, is that um, being a machine learning company, Yandex effectively trained their image tool on as many publicly available social media, uh, review images, etc., etc. As a consequence, Yandex can be extraordinarily good at actually understanding the contents of an image. Not the metadata around it like Google does, and Bing does a little bit, but the act actually matching an image. And I'll show you what I mean later on. It's really, really good at that. One more is uh, a tool called TinEye. Now, TinEye is essentially searches for property rights violations and tries to look for exact matches of your image. Um, again, it can be very, very useful. But if you're sort of wondering right now, well, exactly which tool do I use? And the answer is, in fact, for all of them. I'm going to show you how. Look, uh, if you don't aren't already aware of it, uh, I'm going to use a little tool called the Revi Reverse Image Search Tool. And I'll explain to you how it works as well. Now, Revi is a Chrome desktop extension. Uh, I would suggest you, you pop that term into your search engine while uh, I'm talking and see if you can add that to your Chrome browser. Now, once it's installed, Revi works, just as you can see on screen, every time you right click over an image, it then allows you the option of searching on all or one or a select few of the search engines that it has access to. I will say at this point, you've noticed that I haven't mentioned Baidu. Well, Baidu, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be working terribly well at the moment. So um, we're going to skip past it. It doesn't seem to return great results. But be that as it may, um, you should. Uh, it, it's always worth checking it uh, just to see if it is returning anything. It supposedly searches Weibo, but I have a feeling that a little bit more code is uh, needed to, to make it work. So let's have a little look. Now, first up. This is an image that was shared by Rihanna, and to be quite honest, is actually still up. I'm just going to have a little drink while you're looking at it. Now, through image matching, we're able to determine that it's actually uh, a copy of this image, which was originally put together by uh, an artist or digital artist called 
Anthony Giussi. Now, I'll just pop his uh, URL up on screen because uh, you might want to have a look at his original work. And also, his explanation for exactly what he was doing, which was that it was a 3D visualization that was based on data from my Firewatch and NASA to essentially just create a kind of digital mashup, if you will, of exactly what was uh, going on. And even then, it wasn't necessarily supposed to be fires. Uh, if you go into the detail, it's, you know, fires, hot spots, places that hide high temperatures, etc., etc. A really good piece of work, but unfortunately manipulated uh, and shared thousands of times, including by Rihanna, who actually still has the image up, uh, and uh, creating a total misrepresentation. Look out for that one, by the way, in future, if there are ever bushfires. So, uh, how do you do a reverse image search? Well, let me see if uh, I can show you a little bit how to. And while I'm doing that, I'm just going to flash up the, rever the RevEye extension up. Now, look, uh, the other thing I'm also going to do is I will pop uh, a short URL for this image that I'm actually looking at right now so that you can actually have a look at it too. I'll tell you what, what I might do now is let's see if I can find uh, any evidence of whether this is what it's claimed to be. Now, first, obviously, let's let's open up the, uh, the URL itself. Now, while this is taking time to load, there you go. So here's the image. Now, it's been posted uh, way back in January by uh, one of those anti-5G groups. Uh, and look, there are lots of comments on the images, uh, including this one. You know, people are genuinely worried that this somehow is a representation of exactly a, uh, um, a 5G signal or something that's floating around a human body, following it up the stairs. Uh, I'm going to now run the RevEye extension. So if you watch my screen, I'm going to right click. Reload and so there's our reverse image search extension. You can see how I open up the dialog box. I'm going to choose all search engines and we'll go through them all together. First up, over here. These are the Google search results. Now, really importantly, you need to be aware that Google is searching the metadata around an image, things like captions, things like uh, the page itself, etc., etc. But we've sort of got some kind of matches. Um, there's a Vice article from their motherboard uh, website. Uh, I mean, this is all verified sort of content. So we see that they mention an artist called Nikolai Lam. Uh, imagining the size, shape, and color of Wi-Fi signals. Let's have a little click through it. Let's see if there's any other evidence or any kind of matching imagery. Nothing really to see here. Um, let's, uh, there we go. Not quite a match. Similar, but not quite like that. We keep going and so on. This is probably a dud route. I'm going to go back. But we do see some other images, ghostly images of Wi-Fi signals, um, this one uh, is a BuzzFeed article. Uh, now, I'm going to check in on them because I do know that they'll verify and check everything absolutely thoroughly. And now we start to see some stuff about an artist called Louis Hennan who's got a work called Digital Ethereal. Well, that's that's starting to seem a bit more here. And it looks like oh, there's quotes from him. I bet you they're knowing BuzzFeed. They probably even have a URL down there. There's quite an extensive interview with him. So that's a good lead. Now let's look at Bing. Again, uh, Bing have a link to a Laughing Squid link, and as anybody knows, Laughing Squid's been around forever, and it's a perfectly uh, reputable blog which posts cool photos and stuff. Similarly, here we have a design magazine, and it, again, this reference to the digital ethereal link. So let's just quickly go to Yandex. And again, we start to see this image. We see down here, uh, again, a mention of digital, digital ethereal. So now, oh, and, and here's Tinai again, uh, another link to a, uh, a reputable newspaper, verified content, and a, um, and a mention of a British photographer. And let's just have one quick look at that. Hopefully that loads pretty soon. 
so yeah, here we go. Um, more Luis Hernan. In fact, now they've actually got a video and even a link. So let's have a look at the link. And if we hit the learn more, you can see already that the work is starting to look very similar. Uh, my page is not loading too quickly, but again, more detail about Louis Hernan and, and his photography and some works, some examples of his work and a contact point. Always useful if you want to make that one final check and say, is this work absolutely yours? Hopefully that gives you a pretty basic, but at least a, a beginner's idea of how you can use something like Revi. One little tip I can also tell you is, is um, it can be very, reverse image search can be very useful for matching profile images on social media and also for debunking them. Um, because sometimes an image that you think is of a real person may possibly actually just be a stock image. And just keep that in mind. So my suggestion is keep Revi installed and anytime uh, you you have an image come up with a story or something that's applied to you, give it a try at, at least matching it. We're going to move on and we're going to have a look now at uh, looking at the idea of finding an image based on uh, elements of the picture. Now, this is another crucial thing. And for our New Zealand friends who are joining us today, I do apologize. Unfortunately, this example is an inner Sydney one, but uh, hopefully uh, some of the elements of this uh, make some sense to you in terms of location matching. Now, I'm gonna just quickly share this URL with you while I tell you the story about this picture. Now, this picture was shared by the Daily Mail in Australia online uh, as uh, reporting, sorry, purporting to be the location of a secret COVID quarantine hotel. Uh, the images were shot by uh, for, for exclusively for the Daily Mail and street signs were blurred, which wasn't helpful. However, uh, if you've got that open, or if you don't, it doesn't matter, because I'm going to talk you through some of the elements in this photo that could be used for a search. So, I've chopped it up into pieces, but you've got things like uh, over here, a sign, uh, on a building and a fairly distinctive looking facade, some Venetian blind looking sort of shutters there. Down here, you've got three uh, fairly major outlets, a Coles, a flight center and a pizza hut, right next to each other on a street front in a sort of shopping center. Over here, uh, and this is a very important one, and this translates right across. Um, this is a, um, a, it's a tree but it's also a fairly distinctive tree with a fairly distinctive bark pattern that is um, that is found uh, in certain parts of Australia, but also um, is used only in certain local government areas. Does this happen this way in your areas? Are there certain sort of indigenous trees that you might be able to recognize? Because if you can, that's a really useful skill. Plants are a fantastic way to identify locations. Over here, we have a kind of metal planter thing and a pole in the background, which we could use. Now here, I'm not sure if you can see it. It's a pretty small image, but it's essentially a green H and I think an O, and it's reflected in a window. Looks like the font for some sort of sign. It's kind of distinctive. Uh, and again, here's another shot of this other building over here, sadly with the street sign uh, a blur. Now, uh, in this exercise, uh, really, it's just a case of, um, I did try, by the way, uh, looking for a match online, but there was no uh, response to a reverse image search. So I knew now I was on my own when it came to actually looking at the location and hopefully finding details in the image that worked. So what did I do? Well, first up, knowing that the secret hotel was in Sydney's inner city, which gave me a head start, I started searching for a Coles and a flight center and a pizza hut in Google, which brought up store directories for shopping centers in uh, Sydney's outer suburbs and one shopping centre in the inner suburbs. So that helped me narrow it down immediately that these shops were only near each other in one place in the inner city. This returned a uh, result for the Coles in King's Cross in Sydney's inner city, which I brought up on Street View. And you can see here, these shops kind of look exactly as they were in the background of the original photo. 
If I turned street view around, I could see the color of the building in the distance with white buses and luggage trailer uh, outside. That building's a holiday inn. And uh, the view to the stores also showed matching poles, planters, and uh, the building viewed in the background of the original. And uh, if I zoom right, and there is, there is that funny looking, oops, there is that funny looking building, which turned out to be a gym. And finally, here's a close up of the Holiday Inn, handily with some very similar looking buses right out in front of it. Now, uh, and you can see there uh, quite easily how the green H of the Holiday Inn would have been reflected in the windows of that bus. Now, as I say, that's a fairly quick exercise. I've kind of condensed um, a few hours staring at an image in very close detail into a few minutes. But actually, if you practice, you can get better and better at it. And the other thing is, is that obviously if you're focusing on local areas or a patch that you understand or know, you've got even more advantages. And lastly, uh, it's always worthwhile, whoops, it's always worthwhile sharing uh, this sort of, uh, if you're trying to verify an image, share it around. You never know what your colleagues will tell you. Now, uh, I'm going to just quickly divert to a pretty good tool called Forensically. Now, I'll just put this up for you so you can uh, at least know what to look for. And I'll also just show you how it works. So I'm just going to open up this URL. What Forensically does, uh, nice and simply online, is allow you in the first instance to upload an image. I'll use their default um, and check for perhaps smoothness around the edge of an image. If you're not happy with the magnification at that level, you can always jack it right up and look even more carefully in an image uploaded. You could also do things like detect things like where that shadow should be in an image. Uh, and there's quite a few other components of an image that you can actually assess. Very useful tool, and uh, I will uh, I'll also share a short link to it for you, just so that you can play around with it. And believe me, it's one of those tools that actually makes um, image analysis a lot of fun because it, uh, it does have this quality where you can upload any image you want to it and slowly train yourself in uh, understanding how overlay works and stuff like that. Anyway, I'm going to move on. So next up, uh, let me just quickly check something. There we go. Um, let me just jump to my next slide. Apologize. So, need to ah, here we go. We're back. Sorry about this, folks. Now we um, I want to just go through a little exercise involving a uh, a video of a kangaroo hopping across a bridge. And you know what? While I just fix up my slides, I'm going to get you to watch this. Now, hopefully, let me just pause it right here. I'm going to show you a little trick. Um, now, when you're in uh, a YouTube video, if you ever uh, want to uh, just very quickly pause and freeze frame it, uh, just use the full stop button to move it forward one frame and the comma button next to it to move it back one frame. Very easy. Now, I'm just going to do a little forensic work fixing uh, something over here while you
Okay, hopefully, uh, yeah. Okay, all right, folks, I just seem to be having a few technical difficulties while I just fix this up. Here we are. Now, unfortunately, my tweet that is supposed to be there in this isn't loading, but that's okay. I have this to show you. So, just quickly, this amazing photo was shared uh, yesterday uh, on Twitter. You probably saw it. Uh, and what I wanted to do was establish, well, can we uh, put, let, let's have a look and see whether what we can learn about this photo. So in the first instance, let me just see if bring us back. There we are. All right, cool. So it's an absolutely magnificent photo. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, it's I'm going to walk you through a process which would at least narrow down a time frame which you could follow up and check. And um, and this is kind of a fun way to to show you how to basically check a photo. Now, the tweet itself says that that photo was taken at, uh, and bear in mind, uh, my display is showing me Australian time, so that would be 5.20 p.m. New Zealand time. Uh, was it uploaded hours before or hours after it? The photo could have been taken months before. And one thing I will stress to you is, is that at the end of this exercise, you would probably be wanting to check and see with the actual tweeter um, when did you actually take this photo? And just remember my point about exit data and maybe asking them for a copy. Anyway, so that time is actually 5.20 p.m. New Zealand time. So next up, somebody else actually also tweeted a very similar shot, uh, and that was uploaded uh, at 6.11 New Zealand time. Uh, but back to our first user. Now, at 11.24 a.m., she tweeted this from St. Bathans. The position of the sun suggests it might have been shot some hours before that uh, time of day. Uh, this is a really good opportunity to use a tool called SunCal, which tells you whether this checks out. Now, I'm just going to share that URL with you, by the way, because it is very useful. Now, okay, so look, the, um, let me just check something. I seem to have lost access to my banners. Hopefully they'll come back. Um, but what you can see over here is uh, we're looking at basically the position of the sun uh, at around that time of day over St. Bacon's. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, sorry, here we go. I can just you, finally give me that sun count banner. So you can use SunCal. Uh, it's a really simple to use tool up here. You can see the position of the sun uh, and it'll also change at different times of day. So that it gives you kind of pretty easy to understand display on how it works. I'm just gonna keep going. Now, initially I assumed she, she would be on a flight from Christchurch, but once I knew that she was in St. Bathans and we know that Queenstown is uh, a much closer drive, it's uh, just under two hours. And of course you can use, the, you can use Google Maps. I decided to go to a tool called Flight Radar to get an idea of flights around that time. So this was how I did it. So, and uh, there's the flight radar URL for you, by the way. So moving on to flight radar. Now, and by the way, here is uh, an indication of when the sun rose, for instance. I'm using the timeanddate.com website to show that. You can see that the sun rose uh, at around, well, maybe about 12 minutes past eight in the morning. So that photo may well have been taken closer to that time of day. Now, with uh, back onto flight radar, you can actually browse um, departures from different uh, airports at different times of day. And in this case, um, I found uh, an example of an A320, which was the sort of plane that uh, Air New Zealand operates on its domestic routes. You can see that from the, uh, uh, the, the wing on the plane, which actually matches this one here. And you can see at roughly at about 5.20, that flight crosses over Kaurangi National Park. Now, just wondering, this probably gives you an idea that that may well have been where she was 
when she snapped that photo. Now, as I say, uh, at the end of the day, it's probably best to contact the tweeter and ask them for a copy of the photo and uh, to, to then additionally verify it with exit data. But hopefully that gave you a little idea that um, using, uh, there, that there are other tools in particular, just even on your just Twitter account to uh, then see about verifying the image. Now, uh, back to our hopping kangaroo. Now let's see if I can make this one work this time. Um, so by freeze framing through that image, we're able to now see elements of the photo. This is kind of a similar exercise to looking for the secret quarantine location. But this time, you're actually also looking for built features. So as I click through, you start to see uh, things like a wall, uh, another electrical tower, uh, sort of playground and barbecue area and picnic equipment. There's a fairly unique and rather odd looking statue. And up here is uh, a pub or a building with a red roof with what looks like the letters M-O-T or possibly H-O-T. And again, as the kangaroo goes past, a fairly distinctive sort of tree. And finally, a blue building that could be used to identify something. Now, um, what this involved was firstly a trip to Google Earth. And can we match some of the scenes that we've actually looked at, uh, some of the scenes that we've actually freeze framed through? So uh, here we have a wharf uh, with, again, a few other scenes. I've moved to Street View, by the way, soon. Um, here is a car park. And by the way, down at the bottom of this is a building with a red roof with the words hotel and motel in it. It's directly across from a playground as well. And hopefully, now that I moved to Street View, you can start to match a few more locations. There's the electrical tower in the background, those guardrails and the walking path on one side of the bridge. There's that wharf. And here are some of those very distinctive playground, barbecue area and park elements. You can see things like these lampshades, this really odd sculpture over here. And finally, if we keep looking, there's a blue building, the 60 kilometer an hour speed sign, oops, and more of that playground. Now, uh, this is uh, essentially what that involves is breaking a video down into frames and analyzing them frame by frame. And a very important tool deserves a bit of a mention over here. Now, uh, Amnesty International developed this uh, as a way to help human rights organizations uh, verify videos that were sent to them. It's brilliant. It actually uh, opens up videos into individual keyframes, which you can then reverse search. Now, uh, a couple of things that you should always keep in mind, uh, especially when you're using something like this, is that do remember that the upload time can sometimes be later than when the video is shot. Sometimes that might seem like it's stating the obvious, but again, you do need to keep thinking about things like that. So in this case, when I ran our kangaroo video through it, it did have a caption that mentioned uh, that the person filming it was walking along Phillip Island, walking across the Phillip Island Bridge. So that was another part of verifying it. I'm going to move on to another verification tool, which is very good. Uh, again, I'm going to just simply send, suggest you search for it this way. It does have a pretty clunky URL. Uh, and uh, again, Invid's data viewer is another keyframe analysis tool. It allows you to uh, extract individual keyframes from videos, which you can then reverse search. Uh, and obviously uh, with Invid, it will limit itself to Google image reverse search, but you can always run your RevI Chrome extension through it. Okay, so um, this is an important one. This is uh, an example of why you should never rule out a, a text search for a suspect image. Now this tweet is still up and it's kind of um, essentially trying to 
use a word play over the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone as part of the Black Lives Matter protests and link that somehow with uh, Chaz Bono. Now, I right clicked over the image and searched all search engines. Google's results immediately returned uh, different text on the sign in some of them, uh, and also returned uh, a link initially to Chaz Bono's Facebook page with, with the original sign. So that's actually a very quick verification. Uh, it turned up this image on his Facebook and Twitter pages, as did uh, many of the other tools. I will show you, though, this is the Bing result, and have a look at how uh, much better it's matched him, okay? It hasn't really... Uh, it's done pretty well on the image itself because it's found the two, two original sources of it, but it's done a really good job of matching him. And uh, here is the original as posted on his Facebook page. Now, here, just for your information, is the amazing Yandex result, which... Uh, absolutely brought back matches with images for Chaz Bono that were uh, uh, heaps more results than uh, all of the others. Really good. And again, a little bit more. And finally, you see up here in the top right-hand corner, another result with his Facebook page. So here's a different exercise. Now, this one is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's probably a lot like that one with uh, the Daily Mail. It involves a little bit of location, a little bit of research, a little bit of Google. So let's see how we go. Okay, I'm going to share this URL with you, by the way, for the image, so in case you want to uh, play along at home. So this image has been shared really, really widely amongst the anti-wind turbine community. Uh, you can kind of see why. Um, the house looks almost like it is, has the wind uh, turbine sprouting from underneath it. Um, but have a really close look at the image. What are you seeing in the image? Are you starting now, after all of this time of, you know, let's look really closely at the contents here. You're looking at features of the house, like the gas tank, it's things like the flagpole, that orchard in the background. They're all important features. Um, and what I want to know is that turbine today, now, literally on top of that house. Now, um, looking at some results, Google uh, returns results mostly from uh, anti wind farm uh, websites, mostly reuses. Bing, on the other hand, kind of a similar sort of set of results, mostly reuses. Uh, and however, Yandex does actually score a few hits. Now, it found an article in a blog uh, discussing the plight of a family called the Shinal Deckers, which in turn, and I apologize, that's taking a little time to load. Let me try that again. Uh, that's better. Um, discussing the plight of a Shinal Decker family and posted a caption uh, describing an industrial scale wind turbine. It contained information about measurements uh, in, in reference to the home, saying that uh, during installation, uh, one of the turbines would be 1,139 feet from the home. It also referred to a lawsuit. Um, and at this point, I did a Google search, a basic Google search for uh, the Shinal Decker home and it turned up this document, which is a uh, part of a document cloud uh, trove used by a reporter named Emily Lacoz, who at the time was working for uh, a media outlet called Gatehouse Media. Now, the article itself was heavily debunked uh, itself, but it did at least contain important detail that the home was somewhere between some roads called Brian Morton Roads indeed in a place called Ludington County on a road called West Kistler Road in Michigan. So on Google Maps, I was able to locate the street. And I'm just going to switch to satellite view when it loads. Now, the really cool thing here is we now see that we have, we can identify the location of some wind turbines. There's actually one just up here too. 
Oops, let me just go back to that. So you can see here, uh, as I switch to satellite, we start to get a nice clear picture of the stream. And importantly, we're able to use the measure distance tool to perhaps look at distances and see how far these various turbines are from the houses. That's going to help you with your verification. Now, when we go back to the, and I'll just quickly now jump to street view. Oops. So we can see that, uh, or at least in the spirit of here's what I prepared earlier, I can tell you from measuring them that none of the turbines was within that magic 1,139 feet. Now, if we move closer to this particular house, we can start to see that features of the house particularly match what was in our original photo. Uh, I'm just going to actually go back to the satellite view because you can only see this from here. Here, once we zoom right into the property, we can see that distinctive gas tank and the large tree, for instance, and down here, this orchard. So the photo was kind of taken from around here. If you run this, all, this location through Google Earth, you can actually also look at the 3D of the terrain and see that the photographer was probably standing on a rise about here. Now, I'm going to move on a little bit because we've got a couple more things to get through. But hopefully, that helps you at least get started on looking at how you can debunk uh, an image or at least get some more detail about it so that you can then use your organic tools like calling somebody up and uh, finding out if something's real. Okay, so, and here is the SunCalc tool, really handy. I'm gonna flash this URL up again. I really suggest, take a little time to learn it. It's pretty cool, especially uh, if, for instance, uh, use it in your own local area, uh, somewhere you know, so that you have a, an idea, okay, this, uh, of how it works. Um, I'm gonna switch our attention just for a little bit to a few tools to getting you started on verifying accounts uh, on social media. Now, first up, the bottometer. Uh, or do you say the bottometer? It's up to you. Uh, I would recommend it for when you have a suspicion that an account may well uh, be a bot. Uh, interestingly, I actually ran an account called Bot Plagues through, and the bottometer uh, gave me a strong indication, as you can see here from that arrow in the orange area, that it might well be a bot. Um, again, with a lot of these tools, um, I they, they are um, the people who create bots essentially are also reading all of this stuff. So they're always trying to outdo them. So my sus suspicion is, uh, suggestion, I'm sorry, is, is use this as a way to give you an indication. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a couple of other tools that may help. Um, look, there's other things that you should always think about. Um, uh, tweet syntax is really important. Bots, tweets have a kind of, um, a, 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 an algorithmic logic uh, to them. They're, they're usually formulaic or repetitive. Uh, you might find the same responses in lots and lots of places. Uh, you know, you also think about things like tweet semantics. Uh, they might be overly obsessed with one thing. Look at their tweets over time. Uh, and for that, I'm gonna show you a little tool uh, called the account analysis tool. Now this is free. I'm just gonna share the URL with you. Uh, and all you do is you basically go and pop your, well, first you have to log in, but uh, add the Twitter handle of the account that you want to analyze into it. Now, let's look at this one, okay? This is a little um, one that seems to uh, respond to a lot of alt-right sort of comments and, you know, criticize journalists and stuff like that. So I thought I'd run it through um, account analysis. And as you can see here, it seems to do a lot of tweeting um, oops, at one or two o'clock in the morning. Sorry, folks, I just lost my screen. Uh, I seem to do a lot of tweeting 
at one or two or three o'clock in the morning, um, Australian time. Uh, this seems kind of weird, really. Um, I don't know anybody that gets up specifically to tweet at that time of day. So maybe we can uh, make an assumption that this account uh, perhaps isn't a local account. Uh, so it's worth looking at the results you get. As always with these things, my suggestion is run your own account through it because you understand your own behavior really well. Uh, and hopefully it'll give you um, some indication of how the thing works. Uh, and always don't forget reverse image search. It's really a really good way to basically uh, get your debunking of a social media account started. Okay, so I'm just gonna, a couple more things I wanna show you. This is a tool called Twillets. Um, Twillets has a free option, but it uh, essentially, look, its paid option is far more generous and maybe you might wanna talk, uh, you might wanna talk to your bosses uh, or you might even wanna think about investing it in yourself. Now, what it allows you to do, it allows you to um, essentially load up the contents of someone's uh, Twitter account uh, and uh, you know, absolutely uh, look through all of um, things like its tweets, the followers it has, uh, you know, its following. You can download all of this into a handy Excel spreadsheet and then um, review all of that. And as always, uh, don't forget a simple image search, uh, especially for a social media profile image through Yandex, could actually uh, save you a lot of time. Okay. Another, and this sounds kind of sneaky, but another uh, way to help verify an account is, well, run it through Twitter's reset password field. Now, this sound, might sound a bit funny, but... What you do, and oh, and by the way, don't actually try and reset their password. Uh, but if you do that, what you end up with is you get, as you can see on screen here, an indication perhaps of maybe an email address. Now, in this case, this is a popular, well, not popular, this is a QAnon New Zealand uh, account, which I was looking at today. Now. As you can see here, QAnon types are deeply paranoid. Uh, he or she has a Proton Mail account. I can tell that because um, those asterisks match up to protonmail.com. So I'm going to make a, a pretty solid guess that it's a Proton Mail account, which means it is completely secure and very popular with the nutjobs. However, uh, let's see what account analysis gives us in this case. Okay, so let me see if I can get that up. Okay. So here we have some kind of associated URLs. Um, you've got, you can look at things like the rhythm of the tweets, when they're tweeting. Uh, uh, and just to be clear, this account actually also posted a video. Uh, and if you look at that video, uh, and if you freeze frame it and zoom into um, uh, some parts of it, you can actually identify some of that using some of the tactics we already have. But you can download the account's followers, et cetera, for some deeper analysis for that sort of thing. So worth looking at that. Now, uh, another little example, um, Judith Collins recently, the newly elected New Zealand opposition leader, uh, recently said uh, about um, Helen Clark that she's utterly un un underemployed. And that's why she's on Twitter all the time talking about what the government should be doing. Well, that is uh, pretty interesting. And that is a really good opportunity use something like Twillets to download the uh, uh, entirety of, uh, say, Helen Clark's account and use it for some analysis. So uh, a couple of things I just want to show you. Uh, this was actually, and you know what, I'm just going to share this. Okay, let me just look you through this. Now, this was a tweet that was recently put out by the US Department of, um, uh, I don't know, I mentioned what, home, home affairs, I think, uh, or home security. Anyway, um, look, this was actually aimed at how to spot Twitter fakes, and that's actually pretty cool. Uh, from the top, you can see there, we've got things like uh, misspellings, uh, look for recently created accounts, Unusual usernames or handles, always an interesting one. 
uh, incorrect logos, flags, or phrases. And they'll start to show you some of these. So you can see here uh, in some of their examples, and this is interesting because they used examples of fake Antifa accounts. Uh, and, you know, you can see here uh, a, you know, misuse of hashtags, uh, you know, stuff like, um, again, uh, this, this is interesting because somebody was a bit sloppy. The location here shows that uh, it was sent from Vladivostok in Russia, um, you know, um, misspellings, uh, you know, odd looking logos, misused flags. It's uh, a very common, uh, a very useful way to actually uh, search and verify content. Now, um, one, one more tool. This is a, this is about uh, the best tool there is for searching Facebook. But I've got to tell you that searching Facebook is, is often pretty frustrating and futile these days, as many people would tell you. It's limited to Facebook's people search, but it is an easier to navigate interface. Okay. Uh, let's sort of, you know, you can use it to search for, for instance, um, uh, I used a, a search term much like this to find people who work in New, in New Zealand's Ministry of Health who might be called Jane. Uh, it's a little bit hit and miss, but it's a better interface than Facebook's interface is. So uh, finally, I want to talk about domain tools, uh, particularly uh, one which I think is really useful. I'll just flash that up on screen. So um, Central Ops uh, do a beautiful set of domain tools, which I thoroughly encourage you to bookmark. Now, it's got some really good um, domain search tools. I decided to run the URL for the New Zealand Public Party through uh, the uh, domain search tool and was able to extract the fact, whoops, let me just get that back up on screen, that um, despite the fact that it was, it was on a Whois uh, website, which then meant that it was essentially a US domain, I was able to at least extract the fact that there was this email address for something called uh, info at michaelstace.com. Now, Michael Stace is a private investigator uh, in Wellington. And here I then found his website and finally was able to find his PI's license uh, and obviously a business, a business registration number as a way of um, perhaps potentially following him up. Um, uh, well worth thinking about it. If you are coming across, uh, you know, political parties, activist websites, things like that, I can't stress enough. Sometimes a domain search is the best way to go because um, people are registering their, their companies. It's official business stuff. And in many cases, unless they're using uh, an anonymous platform or uh, something like that, uh, you could potentially find details which will help you uh, chase people up and uh, yeah, and, and, and can actually be a very good and useful way to verify content. Now, we've uh, pretty much reached the end of our session today. I do encourage you to go to g.co slash news training. Uh, and if you do have a question about anything, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, I, uh, and you'll find I'm always, always ready to respond to emails or uh, even if you DM me about any of the stuff that we've covered today. But uh, for uh, now, it's been absolutely fantastic being with you and uh, I really, really hope you found this useful. And uh, do uh, keep an eye out for Walkley's or Google News Initiative events in the future. Thank you very much.